dive in here in verse 21 and 22 and just go through some information here and uh, look here at Romans 9. Uh, we're back in this passage. We introduced it last time. This is the third objection uh, where um, Paul is answering the Jews. He's talking directly with the Jews and to the Jews and obviously also to you and I as we study this. Verse 19, he says, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that resist against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made us thus? And the objection there in verse 19, really there's kind of two parts to it. So there's going to be two answers, two part answers to it. In verse 19, why does he yet find fault? And that issue we introduced last time about yet finding fault. Yet in the timing thing, in a timing scenario, uh, why is he continuing to do this? Why is God continue? Why can't God do finish out the promises made to us, Israel? finish out our program, as well at the same time deal with the Gentiles and be merciful and so forth and do that. Why can't both programs run at the same time? And honestly, that is a great dilemma for a lot of people. When you, uh, We used to have some uh, folks that went here that, that that was their big, when we were down on baseline, that was their big push. God could work both programs at the same time. And Paul's going to say, no, and we looked last time, no, he doesn't do that. Because if he was to do Israel's program, he would have to make them, well, he's going to say it there in verse 22. Uh, well, verse 21, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? By the way, again, notice the word vessel is singular, so that's Israel. One moment Israel is a vessel of honor, and one moment they're made into a vessel of dishonor. Then in verse 22, what if, if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with, with much long suffering the vessels? Now it's plural. Now we're talking about Israel is a vessel of wrath, but so also are the Gentiles vessels of wrath. So he's going to endure that. Uh, with long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of what mercy so what if if god had finished out israel's program in act seven we talked about this last time we'll see it again more next time when we get into 23 and 24 here specifically in act seven stephen looks up sees the lord standing all the prophets say that when the lord stands it's to come back and pour out his wrath. So if God had kept, if God was doing Israel's program while at the same time trying to do something with with uh, with um, the Gentiles, he would be a he'd be an unstable man. He'd be double minded. In one instant he's pouring out wrath, and in the next instant he's got to pour out mercy. And and that's a God is not the author of confusion. That's very confusing. And what happens is, is where that thought in today comes from is, well, Paul will say that uh, Peter said that we have to be saved like they do in Acts 15. Paul will say in Romans 15, those in Christ before me. So then that means that, that the, <laughs> the Jews are getting saved just like the Gentiles and the Gentiles are getting saved just like the Jews. So it's all a blending and it isn't that way at all. In Acts 7, there's a distinct break dispensationally and how God's dealing with man. So Paul is answering verse 20, the end of that verse, why hast thou made me thus? That's really the objection. God's doing this to us. We didn't do anything. Paul, we see the answer to the first objection. We see you're right. God's word has been working since Abraham with Isaac and with Esau. I'm sorry, with Jacob and not Esau. We see that. We got it. We're on board. So why is God still holding us in this accursed state? Okay, Paul, second objection. We get it. God, it, God has the right 
to be merciful to whom he would be merciful, and he has a right to have a secondary purpose in dealing with the adversary. We got it. We're on board. So why is he still doing this to us? See, that, that's what's happened. So this third objection here really is, why hast thou made us thus? What, why are you still yet? Why are you still continuing to hold Israel in a status of being cut off, accursed? Why didn't you, can't you just finish out their promises, get their program done, and do this? So Paul is answering that. And ultimately, God never planned for both programs to operate at the same time. So then everybody, again, well, in Acts, well, what about Acts? You know, you got Peter still doing, and you got Paul, and you got all this going on. Then that would help you understand what Acts is really all about. Acts is not about establishing the historical beginning of the church, the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul does that in his writing. Acts is a written indictment against Israel. See? So if you catch that, then quickly you dismiss the arguments of, well, he's, he is really doing, and you get the, the, you get the C.R. Stam little thing going where you got him going at the same time. And, and, and in God's mind, it isn't that way at all. In God's mind, in Acts 7, Israel's program ended, and he started something else, Dispensation of Grace, Church, Body of Christ. Boom, we're doing something else. So now you have this diminishing, Romans 11. When we get to Romans 11, and we begin to see how God was dealing with them in verse 11 and 12, there's a diminishing away of Israel because of Israel's history, who they are, they're, the mat, they're there, but in God's mind, he's not dealing with Israel anymore. What are they? They're accursed. They're cut off. They're interrupted. It's only us that come along that want to argue rather than just take what the book says and run with it and, and be okay with it. See, we got to have everything functioning so that we can answer the what-if scenario. You know, you know, we were talking a couple men's fellowships ago about, well, what about the people over here who've never heard? And, and you get into this what-if syndrome. And, and it's like God doesn't work in what-ifs. He works in absolutes. And this is an absolute scenario here. So Paul brings up now in answering the question, why hast thou made us thus? Why are you still doing this? So Paul, again, once again, reaches back into Israel's history in verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay? And Paul reaches back into Israel's history, into the precedence that was set in Jeremiah 18, we'll get there in just a minute, of the potter and the clay. Now watch 21, over, uh, hath not the powder power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy? which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of who? The Gentiles. The Gentiles carry a status, since Genesis 11, of vessels of wrath. They've been turned over to Romans 1. God gave them over. He gave them over. Three strikes, three times. He gave them up. He gave them up. Why? Because they, would, they rejected his word. They rejected his goodness. So the, the Gentiles are on the path to wrath. They've been turned over to the satanic policy of evil. So the Jews then, what has happened to them? Well, in one instance, they are vessels of dishonor. In one instance, and, and as vessels of dishonor, what are they ready to do? What's God ready to do there? Pour out his wrath, suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. What's, what's he going to do to them? Wrath. So the potter has the right to do what? Assess the clay. He takes the lump. If it's of, if it's of inferior, he vessels of dishonor, crush it. If it's of superior quality, 
what's he do? Vessels of honor. So Israel here, historically, timing-wise, in Paul's ministry, Acts 7, they are vessels of dishonor. God is ready to pour out his wrath. Yet what has he done to them? He's reshaped them into vessels of mercy. Just as he did with the Gentiles and dispensationally. We'll get over into Romans 11 and we'll see in verse 15 where he talks about the reconciling of the world. What's he doing? How, how could he do that? He had to reshape the status of the world. He had to reshape that just as he does here. So come back to Jeremiah 18. This morning, I just want to run through the Old Testament, show you this pattern here of the potter and the clay, Jeremiah 18, because that's what Paul does. Paul reaches in Israel's history, pulls out the precedent to answer the question of why, why are you still doing this to us, God? Why can't you finish one, do the other, do both at the same time, do something? We're on board. We got it. You can do it. You're God. But yet, why are you still doing this? And ultimately, the answer is really God's not doing it to them. It's who? They are. Because the potter, if you're in Jeremiah 18. Run back there to Romans 9 just real quick. If you look there... In Romans 9, if you look at verse 20, and again, we looked at this last time, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing, what? Formed. It doesn't say created, it says formed. So that vessel of honor, vessel of dishonor, vessel of wrath, can that thing formed say to him that formed it, who would that be? The potter. See, the clay doesn't have a demand, doesn't have a right on the potter. The potter has the control of the clay. Now, that's going to come out as we go through this, Jeremiah 18. Here's the precedent. Here's where Paul's referring to, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, I'm sorry, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. So where is he going? To the potter's house. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. What's the potter doing? He's got the lump of clay, he's got his little bowl of water, and he's working the clay, isn't he? Verse 4, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Now, notice, notice the, the precedent. Notice the picture. You've got the potter. He's got the power over the clay. The clay is marred. Look back at chapter 13 of Jeremiah and verse 7, and notice what the word marred is a reference to. 13, 7. Then I went to the Euphrates and digged and took the girdle uh, from the place where I had hid it. And behold, the girdle was marred, comma, it was profitable for what? For nothing. So what does it mean when he says the clay is marred? It's profitable for what? Nothing. It's useless. The potter has shaped it. It's good to go. And yet there's what? There's a mar in it. Now, if you go over there and you take it and you put it in the fire and you cast it and you get it all ready and then you come over there and you use that vessel, say it's a picture, and you put water in it, what's the water going to find? The marred part, see? Water's going to find the, the hole. So instead of doing that, what, is it, what does the potter do? Just crushes it down and reshapes the clay. He doesn't go get more or a different lump or different clay, he just, you know, I think about that goofy movie with Patrick Swayze, Ghost, and Demi Moore and all of them are making the potter, and he comes up behind her, you know, husband and wife, Rootsy, and, and, you know, all this stuff. Well, that's not what's going on here, but the, that's the idea. You go take a pottery class, and what do you learn? You learn how to 
you know, you if you don't hold your hand just right and the wheel, you know, the wheel's going too fast, you get a wobbly looking thing. So what do you do? You crush it down and you start over. So the picture, the clay is marred. It's profitable for nothing. So what can the potter do? Start over. So Paul is set, telling, uh, he's reminding Israel something here about who Jehovah God is as the potter. He can take the clay, and because it's marred, it's inferior, he can reshape it. He can take Israel, a vessel of honor. Now think about Israel and Israel's history. In Israel's history, they were a vessel of honor. You remember King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba? And Queen of Sheba comes and she says, the half wasn't told. Look at Israel, was a vessel of honor. Israel, God says, you are my diadem. You're my glory. You're it. You're mine. They're a vessel of honor. And yet here, he's going to make them into a vessel of what? Dishonor. Why? Because Israel has failed to respond correctly and appropriately to the Word of God. And that's always the case. You, you, you have to go back. Remember Exodus 19. Remember Deuteronomy 15. He says, that covenant agreement, if you obey my word, if you obey my commandments and my statutes and do them, then I will what? Bless you. You will be a vessel of honor. Deuteronomy 15. But if you don't and you do evil, then you will be cursed. You will be a vessel of dishonor. It's in the contract. So Israel, the clay, became marred. So in response to the quality of the clay, God, i.e. the potter, has the right to reshape it from a vessel of honor to a vessel of dishonor, from dishonor back to honor. And in the case where we're at in Acts, they went from dishonor to wrath because of that fifth course of judgment. Now watch verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot, cannot, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Boy, what a question. Israel, can I, cannot I do this to you? And the answer, of course, is what? Yes. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation, now watch, against whom I have pronounced... Turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice. Notice what the evil is. Not obeying the voice of God. That's the evil. The evil isn't out drinking and smoking and carousing and doing all that. The evil is very specific here. By the way, when you get in Hebrew epistles, the sin, when he talks about sin in there, it's very specific. It isn't just generic. You know, the Bible thumpheads, they go generic, and it's not. It's very specific. Keep reading. If, verse 10, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So, what's the case here? What's the scenario here? In response to the clay, Israel, God can then, God in his free will has let Israel in her free will do what? Believe or not believe? Obey or disobey? Do good or do evil? And God says, in response to what you do, I will do this. In your response to obeying the word of God, I will then do good. In your response of doing evil, disobeying the word of God, not listening, then I will do evil. I will curse you. I will bless you. 
You see the covenant agreement there? Th this isn't, this is, again, the old Calvinistic idea of God before the foundation of the world destroyed, did all this. No, what's God say? God's very flexible. I, I hope you come to realize that. He's very flexible. He, his word is his word. But then how you respond will then dictate on how he's going to respond. And that's what Israel is learning. And again, what they're learning from the potter and the clay analogy here is that God, as the potter, has expectations of the clay, of Israel. And he has the right to respond, to mold the clay into the vessels that demonstrate who they are. As a vessel of honor, who are, what are they doing? They're obeying the word. They're, they're, they're making the Gentile nation see what it is to have God as their head, Deuteronomy 4. Or are they over here falling in with the Baal worshipers and the idol worshipers and following the, little, the uh, idolatry and all that? And then what are they doing? Well, what does Paul say in Romans? You've blasphemed the name of God before the Gentile, Romans 2. Well, then if that's the case, then which one are they? That's what's happening here. So again, God to Israel, you've got the right to do whatever you want to do. But I have the right to change my mind and how I'm dealing with you. If you want to break the agreement, then we'll break it. And if you want to keep it, then we'll keep it. But you decide. You tell. You decide. I've already decided. I want to do good to you. I want to bless you. But if you don't do what needs to be done, you don't hold up your side of the bargain, then my side changed. And if you, again, if you think about the Acts period, which is historically where we're at in Romans 9, what have they done? What has Israel done? You come out of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what have they, what have they been trying to do since almost day one with him? Kill him. Why? Because he claimed to be God. Now, he is God. He's demonstrating himself to be God, the Messiah. But they're trying to kill him. They've rejected the word. They've rejected what the prophet said, what Moses said. So they kill him. Then they go after the little flock, the believing remnant. And in Acts, what, what's the believing remnant doing? Jesus of Nazareth, and they're just they're indicting Israel over. But yet, what is Israel? What have they been? <laughs> they've been a vessel of dishonor, and they've just climbing. They've been rejecting God's voice, i.e., the little flock. They've been rejecting God's word, and in response to that, what has God done? He's reshaped them into vessels of wrath. It's time to pour out my wrath on you. It's time to destroy you. And that's really what, come over, you're in Jeremiah, come over to chapter 19. That's really what Paul's doing here. When, they, when Israel objects and says, and by the way, why in the world would they object to what God's doing today? We'll see it we'll, uh, next time, we'll go over the verse over in Thessalonians where he says they persecute you, they're keeping me from preaching, and I'm the one holding back the wrath. See, they don't understand. That's why they would sit there and say, just finish out our program. Whenever I hear anyone say, God's working both programs at the same time, or why can't God finish Israel and then do, that tells me that they don't understand Israel's program. They think they do, but they don't in the nuts and bolts. So that kind of helps you with an identification issue of who you're dealing with. All right? Jeremiah 19, look at verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Go and get, at the pot, get a potter's earthen bottle, and take of the ancients of the people and of the ancients of the priest, and go forth unto the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the east gate, and proclaim there the words that I shall tell thee. So what's he got? He's got the potter's vessel, doesn't he? He goes to the gate, verse 3, and say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of the host, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which soever heareth, I'm sorry, the which whosoever heareth, his ears shall tingle. 
So, Jeremiah, you go get the potter vessel. You go over there in the east gate. You stand there, and you're going to say these words. And in verse 3, Hear ye the word of the Lord, of, O, o God, uh, I'm sorry, O kings of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil. You're going to listen to what I say. Now, gr- drop down to verse 10. Jeremiah gives them the word, 19.10. Then shalt thou break the bottle in the sight of the men that go with thee, and shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city, as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Topet, Till there be no place to bury. Now, what are you gonna, Jeremiah? You go get that potter's clay. You go down there to the east gate. You get up on the stoop there, and you know what you do? You proclaim the word, and then you break that that vessel. You don't just crack it; you demolish it. You smash it. And you know what? You know why you're going to smash it? Because what did Israel do? What was Israel's res- go- what's Israel's response going to be? Disobedience. They're not going to listen. And what Israel is learning here is God comes in, and and by the way, you read the things, and He's like, "Listen, I'm for you, Israel. I want you to be the vessels of honor. I want you to be who I want you to be. But you're not obeying me. You're not doing what I've asked you to do." And you've become the vessels of dishonor. And when that happens, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be destroyed. Now, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Okay? uh, Jeremiah writes two of the five major prophets. But those four major prophets are the four major men prophets of the fifth course of judgment. Now, the minor prophets fit there as well. Okay, they come in, all right? But when you read Isaiah and Jeremiah, Daniel 9, he says, I learned by books Jeremiah. He read Jer- What's going on in Israel's history historically right here? They're being led into what? Babylonian captivity. Leviticus 26, there are five courses of judgment that lay out the history of Israel. It's fascinating. God says, Israel, you're you're my firstborn. And oh, by the way, here's your history. And he tells them prophetically their history. And guess what? Now, if you knew what our history was going to be, the future history would be, would you be a little more careful in what you did and didn't do? You would think so, but not Israel. They're just going to go plowing right on through like nobody told them nothing. Why? Because they don't believe. They're acting in unbelief. So the fifth course of judgment begins with Babylonian captivity. Now, this is Judah. This is Benjamin, the southern two here. The northern ten tribes, which is the rending of their power, the second course of judgment, had the, those ten, they've been carried off under, Assyri- under the Assyrians. They're already gone into captivity, underneath Gentile rulership. Now, when they're underneath Gentile rulership, how's Israel's life? Is it good or bad? It's bad. They're slaves. The Gentiles, I mean, they beat them up. We were talking the other night about Jonah and Nineveh. You want to see some cruel people, read Nineveh's history. They made the Romans look like Sunday school. They were, I mean, peel the slaves and do all this stuff. So what were they doing to Israel? They had them underneath, bam. They weren't sitting back there going, you know, hey, take it easy. Hey, take five, guys. It's okay. No, they're like, no, you owe me another 20. Let's go. See? What did he do? He took the boom and he broke it. But what's breaking it is the use of Babylonian captivity. Captivity underneath, being them under, them them being underneath Gentile dominion. And politically, Israel falls with Nebuchadnezzar. Politically, they're done. They have no political power. They have lost everything. Nebuchadnezzar sacks Jerusalem three times. On the last one, he takes Daniel with him and so forth. 
But Isaiah and Jeremiah actually stay in the land. They're older, so he leaves them there. And they nail them. So the fifth course of judgment begins with Gentile dominion. Now the fifth course of judgment doesn't end until wrath is poured out. Acts 7, what does Stephen see the Lord doing? Standing to come back. So what's coming to a conclusion? That fifth course of judgment. Because after wrath's poured out, who shows up? Second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the, uh, the establishment of God's kingdom. So then Gentile dominion is over and it's, it ends with wrath. Now, back up, because that's a lot of history. Israel sitting there at the start of the fifth course, what's their sign? The potter and the potter's clay. Remember Moses? God gave Moses three signs at the very beginning. Do you remember what they were? Rod the snake, snake back up the rod. Take the hand in, clean, hand out leprous. And then go over and make the water into wine. In all three of those, Israel requires a sign. Okay, the, Jew, the Gentile, the Greek seeks after wisdom. Israel is always looking for a sign. But every time there's a sign shows up, God never says they'll believe it. The Moses, he says, go do this with your rod. Take your rod, throw it down, boom. And if they will not adhere, will not believe that one, here's the second one, second sign you do. Hand in, hand out. And if they don't believe that one, here's a third sign to do, you know, the uh, water to wine. It, God never says they're going to believe the sign, but what are they looking for? A sign. Here's the sign. The sign by Jeremiah, he's given a picture Here's the potter's vessel. You are the potter's vessel. Chapter 18, God has the right to form you. He's formed you into a vessel of what? Dishonor, and you will be broken. You will be destroyed. That's what's coming your way. Come over to Isaiah chapter 45. You guys catch that? You, I hope you follow that. I, I struggled with how much to get bogged down here, but because of some of the great con conversations about Romans 9, 10, and 11, we're going to trudge through some of this a little slower. Because I'll be honest with you, I listened to some of it and from a, and, and out of it, and honestly, some of it comes from just plain ignorance about Israel's program. Because if you don't catch what the potter and the clay thing is in Israel's program, you will not understand why Paul brings it up. If you don't catch in Romans 11 the issue of Abraham and being of Abraham, the father of Abraham from Romans 4, you will completely miss the grafting in and the grafting out in Romans 11. You will make it something that it's not because it's when Paul refers to it, he's referring back to something in Israel's background. Follow that? And what happens is, is we get over there and we break our full necks all over it and all you got to do is back up, come and learn where he's re referencing. It's fascinating also in Romans 9, 10, and 11 that Paul anticipates you knowing this. And I'll be honest with you, 99.9% .9 of grace believers don't know anything about Israel's program in an in a, in a in-depth manner to be able to sit there and say, okay, I, catch, I, I remember Jeremiah 18. I remember Jeremiah. I remember Isaiah 45. You got Isaiah 45. I, a little commercial there. Isaiah 45. This concept, the precedent of the potter and the clay and the vessel and the dashing, has been established in Israel's history right here by the prophets. As they go off into Babylonian captivity, they start that fifth course of judgment. Roman, or Isaiah 45, look at verse number 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it? Isn't that interesting? Who, who's the master? Who's the maker? He's the potter. He's God. What, verse 9, what makest thou or thy work 
he hath no hands. The pacha, the clay, he's, he's shaping you according to your response. Verse 10. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. See the pattern? Who's the maker? Who's the pot shed? Who's the guy? God's sitting there. Again, Romans 9, what are they asking? Why did you make us this way? I didn't make you that way. I made you that way. I didn't make you that way originally. I've reshaped you due to your what? Your response to me. I've determined how to shape you by your response to my word. Woe unto him, verse 9, that striveth with his maker. Roman, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 9. Uh, Romans 9, O oh man, who do you think you are arguing with God? You are nobody. Over there, Peter, in, in, in Acts, that great illustration there, he's been in Acts 10 to Cornelius' home. He's demonstrating the change in the, in the dispensation, and now what God once called unclean is now being called clean. And the, the, the Gentiles, Peter has no understanding yet of why what's going on. He just knows that God sent him over there, and he's defending his actions in chapter 11, and he says, who am I to withstand God? I am nobody. You know, and you better be careful thinking you're somebody, you know. <laughs> Come over to chapter 29 of Isaiah. Again, the, this concept, this precedent, this principle, Isaiah 29, verse 14. We'll start there. Therefore, behold, I will pro proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. N notice that. He's going to do a what with them? What, what one day will he do with Israel? A wonderful work. A marvelous work. Something that, that the elders and the wise men had no clue about. Why? Because they don't believe the prophets. They don't believe the word of God. Verse, verse 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the, from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? Look, look at what they say. They're, they're doing it over here in the dark. Bob Jones Sr. one time said, the character of a man is what he does when no one's looking. You know, you really begin to see what, how people are in the dark. What are these guys doing? They're hiding their work, aren't they? They're over there hide. What did Adam and Eve do, remember? Operation Fig Leaf, and then they went and hid themselves. They're hiding. Verse 16. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? Notice how God... God through Israel, the fifth course is coming, Cap Gentile captivity is coming your way, and it's coming your way because you disobeyed me. I gave you four courses to get right. The fifth one, boom, it's done. Here it comes. I told you how to get out from underneath it. You won't listen to me. You won't obey me. You're over here trying to hide what you're doing, and God says, I know what you're doing. You think you're hiding from me? I see you. God knows who Israel has been, who they, where they've been, where they've been. They've been out worshiping other gods. They've been a whoring after other gods. They haven't been where they're supposed to be. On the surface, what's the Lord say to them in the Gospels? You're whited sepulchers. You look good on the outside. You got everything prim and proper. 
You're doing the right things. You're sitting in Moses' seat. You're following what you're supposed to be doing. But on the inside, you're dead men bones, bones of the dead man. You're corrupt. You're of your father, the devil. See, God sees right into that. But notice the reference of the potter's clay. That, that, that picture is right there. They try to hide from God, but God says what? I see you. I got you. Verse 17. Is it not yet a very little while? And Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall, field shall be esteemed as a forest. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Look at that. There's a future day coming, Israel, when I'll take you and I'll shape you back into a vessel of honor. And when that happens in that day, not this day, not the day of Isaiah, not the day of Babylonian captivity of Gentile dominion, not that day at all, that future day out there when the millennial kingdom is set up, that future day out there, by the way, notice verse 18, it, the deaf hear the words of what? The book. You know what that tells you? That tells you that the word of God's going to be out there in that day. That's a great, great verse on the preservation of Scripture. <laughs> and what's going to happen? The deaf will hear, the blind will see. All of those things begin to happen, and there it is. Come over to chapter 64 of Isaiah. Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64, verse 8. Isaiah 64, verse 8. Notice something here. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father, so this is the believing remnant speaking. If you look back up at verse 6, but we are all we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away, and there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of the tree. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou art our potter. And we all are the work of thine hand. That's the believing remnant. And what are they acknowledging? Isaiah 64, 8. They're acknowledging they're the clay, aren't they? They're acknowledging he's the potter. You see, they, they know that the Lord, Jehovah, is the potter. They know that. They know that if they're suffering, it's because the work of the potter on that marred clay, he's responding to them. The believing remnant says, we know we're the vessels of dishonor, but you know what? We know we deserve it. Again, Israel is a... Nat you have to think about Israel, and again, in understanding Israel's program, Israel is a nation. As, that's how God views them as a nation. Yes, individuals make it up. So there, yes, there is individual justification, but he talks in nation language, the group. That's why he's called over there, the, Paul calls it the commonwealth. You're aliens from the commonwealth, the nation, the group. And Israel, the believing remnant, they know that they deserve to be the vessels of dishonor. But what do they know also is coming in that day? They're going to be made back into the vessels of honor. You think about Daniel 9. Daniel 9, Daniel sees the end of the 70 years. Nebuchadnezzar's gone. The Medes and the Persians are on board. And he says, all right, let's go. National confession time, Leviticus 2640. Boom, let's do it. And then Gabriel says, no, you can't stick a dirty people in a clean land, so we got to go a little more time here, okay? But what is Daniel doing? He says, I'm confessing the sins of my nation. We did this. We, 
your people, we, 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 you know. He's not really, he's concerned about doing it properly. Verse 9, 64, 9. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord. Neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Again, that believing remnant, they understand why they're suffering. They, un- they get it. They're just asking him, don't be, lo- don't be angry with us too long. <laughs> you know, in Revelation, it talks about the souls behind the altar. And they're, how long, Lord? How long are you going to be? How long are you going to wait? How long? That's what Dirk's crying here. How long? The holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. There's the 70th week of Daniel. Right there. Verse 11, our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praised thee is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. They understand what's going on. They understand why. Why are we, why are we in the middle of all of this? Because we're the clay and you're the potter and you found a mar in us and you made us a vessel of dishonor. You made us a vessel of wrath. We deserve it. But just don't, Take too long in doing it. Verse 12. Wilt thou refrain thyself from these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? That's the cry of the saint. How long are you going to do this? So in Romans 9, Paul reminds Israel who are, why is God doing this to us? And he says, you have forgotten about the potter and the clay, haven't you? You forgot about you forgot about something, and I need to remind you about your about the way you're to be thinking, and I need to remind you of the precedent that's already been established by the major prophets. You're in Isaiah still, right? Look back at chapter thirty. Isaiah thirty. <clears throat> Isaiah thirty. Again, the, the reason, <laughs> going through this, kind of on a slow note, and I get it, but it's because you got to understand what's happening here. Because when you and I deal with someone who says Israel's program and the Gentile pro- should be running together, no, it can't run because of the dispensational setting. Isaiah, 20, uh, Isaiah 30, look at verse 14. And he's... By the way, run your eye back up, verse 8. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come, for what? Forever and ever. So the book's going to be there. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Why are they rebellious? Why are they lying? They won't hear the law. They won't obey the word of God which say to the seers, the seers, see not, and to the prophets prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Notice what the people are asking the elders and the chief priests to do. Don't give us the right word of God. Give us over here what our itching ears want to hear. Don't give us the sound doctrine. Give us something over here that just tickles our fancy. See that? I love that smooth thing. You know what the, ad, the Antichrist is going to be? In Psalms 55, call, and he, he talks about him his speech being as smooth as butter. Why? Because he's a politician. And a, you, know, you know how you know a politician's lying? His lips are moving? You know? That's the idea. That, by the way, that's a biblical thought, too. <laughs> Comes right out of scripture. But see, the thing is, is look at what they're doing. Now, drop down, verse number 14. Because of all of that, he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel. That is broken in pieces, he shall not square, spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a shred to take fire from the hearth, or to take water withal out of the pit. He's going to break that vessel. Again, a description of God's judgment, verse 14 is, and the fact that God's judgment is all-consuming, 
He's going to break it into thousands of pieces. Not even enough to go over there and do anything with. He's going to pulverize it. He's going to take Israel because of her unbelief. And he's going to put her through that fifth course of judgment. He's going to put her under the rod of iron of the the rod of the Antichrist, and he's going to pull out of that nation. He's going to bust that vessel up to the degree that they're pulverized. Come over to Hosea. I'll give you a minute to find Hosea. Daniel Hosea. Okay, I told you. Hosea 8. And what Paul is going to get with the, in Romans 9 with Israel It says, you don't want God to finish your program, Israel, because in order, when he's going to finish your program, he's going to take you and bust you like the potter's vessel. He's going to, Hosea 8, he's going to bust you up into thousands. He's going to pulverize you, and you don't want that. You want his long-suffering and mercy. (laughs) You want what he's doing today. That's what you want. Because what's the Jew saying? Just finish our program up. Again, why? They don't understand it. They don't believe the word. Hosea 8. Look at verse 8. Hosea 8, 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no what? Pleasure. For they are gone up to Assyria as a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim hath hired lovers. There's the ten northern tribes. Where are they? They've been carried away. You take the book of Amos, and in one chapter, the ten northern tribes are gone. One chapter. Taking Judah and Jerusalem and Benjamin a little longer. But not in it, not those ten northern tribes. They're here, but what are they? They're among the Gentiles, so they are, when they're among the Gentiles, there is no what? Pleasure, so they are vessels of dishonor. That's what they are. Come back to Jeremiah 22. Jeremiah, the no pleasure vessel. That's not the love boat anymore. They've lost that. That's why he's going to bring, Jeremiah 22, they're going to bring, he's going to bring up Hosea. We'll see it next time. In, in, in Romans 9, because Hosea lays that out for them. Jeremiah 22, verse 28. Jeremiah 22, 28. Is the man Kona a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? There's no pleasure. Because of Israel's unbelief, they have been formed by the potter into a vessel of dishonor. No pleasure. By the way, look at verse 29. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Who, what are they, what's, the, what's the nations going to listen to? What are they to be hearing? The word. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Kona, in Matthew 1, is in the genealogy of Joseph. But what is the curse of the Lord? What's the word of the Lord? No seed of Kona is going to sit. Conanias, in in Matthew 1, is going to sit. He's a son of Solomon. He ain't going to sit on the throne. But wait a minute. God's, the Lord is, uh, he's of the throne of David, the house of Jesse. That's why you need Luke 3 and Mary's genealogy. That's why Joseph is not the father of the Lord, cannot be the father of the Lord. If Joseph was the father of the Lord, the physical father of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, then that verse right there says he doesn't qualify to be Israel's king. So he can't be. So now you go get Mary, and you find out that Mary's descendants, the seed of the woman, comes through David's other boy, Nathan. So it protects that. My point in showing you that in verse 28 is he's a vessel is what? No pleasure. 
Why? Now, come back to Romans 9. Why is he a pleasure? No, because he disobeyed the word of God. So Paul, Romans 9, 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known? What's God willing to do? He's willing to pour out his wrath. He's willing to make his power known. He's willing to put that on display. You don't want that, Israel. Now, we'll pick up in 22 next time and, 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 and get this out. What I don't want you to miss is verse 21, <laughs> the potter and the clay. Paul uses to answer that question of why, has God, why did God do this to us? And he says, you guys have forgot the precedent in your own history of the potter and the clay. In time past, Israel, you're a vessel of honor, a vessel of dishonor, a vessel of honor, a vessel of dishonor. But right now, in this age, at, uh, right now, historically, Acts 7, you became a vessel of wrath, and you don't want that. And the historical setting here, now in Romans 9, in the age of grace, in the but now, Paul is educating Israel on the fact that Israel, you don't want God to finish your program. And you know what? You ought not be objecting to it. You ought to be thanking him for it. You follow me? Because if I wasn't here, look over at Thessalonians here. 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2. So Paul, he's pulling Israel into an understanding that something that has happened historically there at Acts 7 where God, in revealing a new vessel, 1 Thessalonians 2, that new vessel is a vessel of mercy. There's a new revelation here. Then this vessel of mercy is something that the prophets didn't know anything about. In Israel, you need to understand this. Because in Israel's history, what is it? Vessel of honor, vessel of dishonor. That's what they've known. We just saw it. By the way, there's at least 30 more passages we could have run. It's just all through the major prophets about the potter and the clay and the vessel. But see, the thing is, is in Acts 7, God introduces a new vessel that the prophets knew nothing about. It's a vessel of mercy. And the reason that the two programs can't work together is because he should have been pouring out wrath. Now he's pouring out mercy and those don't mix their oil and water. They don't go together. So the fifth course starts with Israel going under Gentile dominion, and it ends with God pouring out His wrath. And that's been postponed by this new program in Israel. You've got to figure that out. Now, look at 1 Thessalonians 2. Watch verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. By the way, if, well, anyway, just, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they please not God, and are contrary to all men. So what did the Jews do? They persecute the believing remnant. Now they're over here withstanding Paul. Now, Paul's going out to the Gentiles, so the salvation goes to the Gentiles. Verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sin always. Now watch, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. What's come upon them? Wrath. They're out there withstanding Paul in the dispensation of grace, the very thing holding back the wrath of God. Now, how... You know, the, why they're doing it, they don't understand. They don't believe the word. That's, what Paul's, that's why I said Paul's educating Israel now, too, of, hey, you don't want to, you don't want God, because what God's doing today is holding back his wrath, because once we're taken out of the, the body of Christ goes home, what's next on the schedule? Wrath. 
So you don't want that. You follow that? All right, anyway, Romans 9. We'll pick up verse 22 next time. I thought we'd get into it, but I drug my feet through the Old Testament a little too long. All right? But it's important for you to understand what is going on in Israel's history. Don't get bogged down in it. You should never spend too much time in the Old Testament. you got to spend all your time in Romans and Philemon and know how to live, how to get along, how to do. But don't ignore the Old Testament because Paul assumes you know a lot of the Old Testament. Actually, Paul makes assumptions that you are very familiar with not only the Old Testament but also the Gospels because he says stuff that requires you to go, huh? And, off, and back you go. When he says we can cry, Abba, Father, where did that come from? That came because he had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on his desk when he wrote it. Because that's where that term comes up. By the way, it doesn't come up in the Old Testament. It come, well, it comes up in the Old Testament, i.e. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So anyway, we'll pick up in verse 22 next time and, uh, and kind of move on down here maybe a little bit more. No promises, okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, we thank you for the shift in the time and the dispensational break and the fact that you are now taking salvation to the Gentiles. And for that, we're very thankful. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. We'll